We're going to start our first presentation with Ed Witkowski, who is a Novak Club member and former longtime president of the club. And he's going to be talking about one of my favorite subjects, which is star clusters. Uh, I love to look at them through the telescope. Uh, Ed says that this star clusters, from naked eye open clusters to compact globular clusters with thousands of resident stars, this is an introduction to star clusters that can be enjoyed and studied by novice astronomers all the way to advanced amateurs with state-of-the-art imaging systems. So please welcome Ed Witkowski. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as uh, Dave mentioned, I'm a uh, quite a long time uh, Novak member or Novakian. Um, actually, I'm going into my 20th year as a Novak member. And one of my first events as a Novak member was a star astronomy day, not the stargaze, but the astronomy day back in uh, 1999. So we re rewind a little bit of history. So I've been doing these kinds of events, either participating out in the field or presenting for quite a, quite a number of years. Uh, f for a few years, I was also uh, Novak's outreach coordinator, so in er introducing the public to our hobby, to our passion, is something that I really enjoy doing. And uh, um, so I'll just go ahead and get started with my uh, Star Clusters presentation. Uh, also, as part of my introduction, I am not a trained scientist, so I am purely an, as an amateur astronomer. And uh, there are a few reasons I enjoy amateur astronomy. Uh, first off, I enjoy the aesthetic beauty of what we are observing up in the night sky. Okay. Um, I also enjoy the scientific factors involved in what we're observing or what we're, what we're working on uh, while we're observing the night sky. And also, Novak is a fantastic club of people. Uh, you, it's great camaraderie, um, and uh, it's a great group of people. So let's just get started with uh, uh, star clusters and introduction. Uh, so there are two different types of star clusters that you can observe up in the night sky. There are what are called open clusters, which are very dispersed objects. And then there are what are called globular clusters. And they're kind of like fuzzballs up in the night sky. If you're observing with a lower power telescope or with a pair of binoculars, a vast majority of the globular clusters will look literally like a cotton ball, small cotton ball. And I'll talk about a little bit more in, de in depth into um, them and the open clusters as we, as we go. So what is an open cluster? Um, First off, an open cluster is, and this is getting a little bit nerdy on you, but it's a physically related group of stars held together by the mutual gravitational attraction of the stars. So pretty much these stars are locked in place pretty much. They're not totally locked in place because I'll talk about one open cluster that is actually moving. Um, or we've actually been able to establish that there is movement in that cluster. But pretty much the stars that are in an open cluster pretty much hold each other in place. Okay. Um, how are they classified? Now we're going to get into a little bit of uh, some of the science that's involved in um, studying open clusters. Um, there is what is called the Harlow-Shapley scheme. And it's a very simple um, classification scheme. Um, it primarily addresses the concentration and richness of the, of the cluster. Uh, there is a, another scientist named R.J. Trumpler who also devised a classification scheme. It's much more sophisticated and it adds the brightness to the scheme so it's a, a few more factors involved. Shapely scheme, rather simple. You're either very loose and irregular, which means you're quite dis you're very dispersed. You're loose and poor. What? Well, you're loose and poor. Um, there's an intermediately rich zone, 
you're fairly rich or you're considerably rich and concentrated. And I'll show you a few examples of those. The Trumpler scheme gets into whether the concentration is detached with a strong concentration towards the center, a weak concentration toward the center, no concentration towards the center. So this is a little bit more involved and a little bit more um, scientific and it takes a little bit more, uh, it's a little more challenging. And also thrown into the Trumpler scheme is you have the range in brightness. So is it a small range in brightness, meaning that almost all the stars are the same brightness? Or is there a large range in brightness, meaning that the stars are across a different range in, in brightness, meaning that they're, they're not really all the same? You have a variety of stars that are in that, in that object. Uh, ri the richness part of the uh, scheme, poor, there's less than fi 50 stars, um, moderately rich Clusters in the Trumpler scheme have between 50 and 100 stars, and a rich cluster would have more than 100 stars. Um, I wish it was darker, but is everyone able to see the what we have right here? That is the Big Dipper. Um, the Big Dipper is not a constellation. We'll throw that out first. The Big Dipper is what's called an asterism. And an asterism is a pattern in the sky made up by a number of stars. So the Big Dipper be looking like a dipper is an asterism. It's not a, cluster, it's not a constellation. Now, scientists have worked on that these stars that are the brighter stars that are in the Big Dipper are part of a local open cluster that our sun is a member of. And the Big Dipper, which is ma makes up part of what's called Ursa Major, it is actually moving. So over time, there's what's called precession, which is stars moving in different directions. I don't have the... Uh, there's a number of simulations where they've gone back in time and they've gone ahead in time and the Big Dipper is not the Big Dipper way back in time and it's not the Big Dipper way ahead in time because the stars are moving in different directions they're not making crazy you know loops but they're they're moving in an irregular pattern but they're still not becoming so uh, far apart that they're not part of the con uh, open cluster. Um, they can also be co what's called compact. And uh, the const in the constellation Cancer, which you will be able to see tonight because it's still visible, is Messier Object 67. It's a rather um, beautiful object. Um, as you can see, th there's a nice concentration of stars right right in the center of it. Um, one of the things about what are called the Messier objects are that back in the 1700s, um, Charles Messier was a astronomer in France and he kept looking up at the sky and noticing fuzzy objects repeatedly in certain locations. Uh, because back in the late 1700s, one of the big uh, academic, scientific um, things that was being done was identifying comets. And he was looking for comets. And what do comets look like when you're looking at them? Fuzzy objects. And he kept seeing these fuzzy objects over and over and over again in the same spot. And it's like, well, this thing isn't moving. So he cataloged them. Uh, there's 110 Messier objects. So when I say something like M67, that is the 67th object that he cataloged. Okay. Um, I'm going to go over a few uh, select winter open clusters. They'll still be visible 
in the western sky. Um, I'm going to talk about what are, what's called the Pleiades, which is Messier Object 45, um, M35, and NGC 2158, which are in Gemini. It's not Gemini, it's Gemini. Uh, we have three open clusters that are in a line in the constellation Auriga that are quite uh, very nice and easily observed. Uh, M41, which is in Canis Major, near the uh, brightest star in the sky, which is Siri the star Sirius. Uh, we'll talk about M44, which is also known as the Beehive Cluster in Cancer. And we'll talk a little bit about a, another scientist named Per Colander. And there are actually a number of open clusters that he cataloged uh, back in the early 1900s, and I'll talk about him in a little bit. But uh, the stars that are in Orion's belt are actually members of an open cluster, and it's also known as Colander 70. So we'll talk about a little bit about that. M45, the Pleiades. Anybody have a Subaru? The Subaru, the Subaru um, logo is actually the Pleiades. In name, too. In name. All right, so if you're driving a Subaru, you're driving a Pleiades also. So a little bit about the Pleiades. Um, so let's see, M45, I have all this stuff written down so I can throw it out at you. But M45 is a wonderful object. Um, a lot of the stars in M45 are younger blue stars. Um, when I first started observing back in the at the turn of the century quote unquote um, I had a smaller telescope which is a telescope called a Teleview Pronto and it's about almost a three inch diameter telescope it's not really big but it was it's a really nice nice telescope so one of the objects that was that I was drawn to initially was the Pleiades um, it's a beautiful object to observe either with binoculars or with what's called a Richfield telescope, a, a smaller compact telescope that has a wider uh, view, provides you with a wider view. Um, there are many nights where I would go out observing and the first thing, especially during the winter time, first thing I would do is I'd go look at the Pleiades. I'd scan around, look at a few other objects, I'd go back to the Pleiades. <laughs> And there were actually some nights where the whole time I was observing, which was maybe two hours, I would flip through different eyepieces at different magnifications just to look at the Pleiades and see how it looked at different magnifications, at different uh, how wide the view was, because it's just a very beautiful, beautiful object. Um, that it's, br it's a bright object. It's easily located, but it's a wonderful object up in the night sky. Next, we have M, what's called Messier 35, M35. Um, M35 is located in the constellation uh, Gemini. And M35, oops, let's go back, is actually this group of stars here. And the open cluster NGC 2158 is actually this one here, okay? So, I had the notes of where, how they, um, so M M35 is approximately 3,000 light years away from us. The concentration, main concentration of stars is about 3,800 to almost, I mean, I'm sorry, almost 3,000 light years away from us. Um, NGC 2158, is about 9,000 light years away from us. So you have two open clusters, one closer to us and one further away. Now, uh, one of the NOVAC members, I think Pete's out, gonna be out here tonight, hopefully. Uh, Pete Johnson has a 24-inch telescope, which is one of the big scopes you're gonna see out on the field. Uh, some of the members have their big scopes here. And one night, many years ago, Pete had his 24-inch up and he said, Ed, come over, take a look at this. And I looked in the eyepiece and I just saw this explosion of stars, a beautiful explosion of stars. 
And I said, wow, that looks like, that looks like M35. And he's like, no, you're not looking at M35. You're looking at, you're looking at 2158. So in his 24 inch telescope, which is pretty big, this cluster actually appeared like this cluster down here. It was a wonderful, beautiful sight. Um, it's readily and easily located in uh, Gemini, down near the feet in, in, the, in the constellation. Next we have N, um, M36, 37, and 38 in the constellation Auriga. So we start, and I've got all the numbers for you here so we can get all nerded out. Um, down here, in the bottom, you have M37. It's about 3,500 uh, light years away. 3,500 miles, that would be great. Um, but three, uh, about 4,500 light years away from us. Um, 36, M36, which is right here, is about 4,000 light years away from us. And 38, which is right up here, is about 4,000 light years away from us. Now, one of the things you'll notice in this image is that it's a rather rich part of the sky because Auriga is right off of where the Milky Way is and the winter Milky Way is. So you have a lot of objects and you have a lot of beautiful stars, region, star, uh, stellar regions to look at um, in Auriga. And it's still a, a visible. If, if you look up at the night sky uh, tonight, you'll see a, uh, a, a pentagon, um, and that's Auriga, and it's north, north. Well, it's above where um, Orion is. So now we're going to go through a few more. Uh, next, we have M41, which is in Canis Major, the big dog, which is immediately. <laughs> which is immediately right next to uh, the constellation Orion. Uh, this bright star here is the bright star Sirius, which is the brightest star in the night sky. All other objects that are brighter than Sirius are planets. Um, and M41 is immediately, literally south of it. And as you can see, it has some very beautiful, beautiful um, a little variety, nice variety of stars, but these stars that appear yellow in it are actually what are called red giants. And they are stars that have been around for quite a bit, and they are large, large stars. Um, if you're looking at the constellation Orion, there's a star there named Betelgeuse, just like the movie. It's spelled different. But it's also a red giant, and it has a orangish hue. Uh, next up is the Beehive Cluster. Oops. In M in uh, constellation Cancer, it's right here. It's a nice open cluster. A vast majority of the stars that are in it are rather new, young stars. The blue blue stars. Blue, bluish blue stars are younger stars in the night sky. Um, it's approximately 600 million years old. So it's a relatively young grouping of stars in the night sky compared to, um, for example, 2158 we looked at a little bit earlier. It's about 2 billion years old. Okay. So now... There are two con open clusters in the constellation named Pupis, which is immediately next to uh, Canis Major and Orion. And you have M46 and M47. Now a little bit about both of those. Uh, M46, which is the little bit more concentrated one down here, is about five and a half thousand light years away from Earth. Um, it contains about 500 stars, and it's estimated to be a young 300 million years old. Okay, 
Now you also have M47, which is over here, uh, which is about 1,600 light years away, about 1,600. It's estimated it's a very young, very young, 80 million years old. Um, and it is composed of also about 500 stars. And they've actually done some studies of stars that are part of the cluster. <coughs> and there's one that is called a red dwarf that they were able to locate within it. Now, there's a bonus. There's a bonus in M46 right here. There's actually what's called a planetary nebula in M46, which is also called NGC 2438. So not only do you have the beauty of an open cluster, you have a planetary nebula um, that resides there. All right, we were talking a little bit earlier about Orion's belt. And we're not talking about men in black, but Orion's belt is composed of these three stars. However, this area is also considered part of what's called Colander 70, an open cluster. Now, a little bit about Per, his name was Per, P-E-R, Colander. He was a Swedish astrophysicist, astronomer, um, that was working on his PhD dissertation at Lund University over in, in Sweden in the early 1900s, about 1920, 1930. So he completed a, a survey of open clusters in the night sky using uh, photographic plates that were available back then, around the 1900s, early 1900s. And he finished his dissertation in 19, let's see, in 1931. So when I was re-engaging in astronomy in the, in, in the late 1990s, I dug up the colander list. There are about 450 some odd colander objects. And I did a little research, you know, on the internet, of course, the early internet, and hey, there's this guy named Per Colander, and he was at Lund University, and, and uh, he did his dissertation there. So I was able to find the email address for the admin staff at the astronomy department. Um, so I sent them an email. I said, hi, my name's Ed Witkowski. I'm an amateur astronomer. I'm doing an amateur research project on open clusters because I really enjoy open clusters. And a reference document I'd like to find is Per Colander's on structural properties of open clusters and their spatial distribution, right? So I sent them an email. I, was, I said, hey, it would be great if you had a, a Xerox copy. Three days later, in a Swedish express mail package arrived a fresh, never read copy of Per Colander's dissertation. Now you're going to ask me, how did I know it was a fresh copy? Because when it was printed, it was printed where it multiple sheets were printed together and then bound. So I had to use an X-Acto knife to cut through the edges. So you never know what kind of a fun thing you're going to find in the mail. So I'm sitting at work and I worked with a company then that you, know, you had to have a security clearance and they were all paranoid about stuff. So I get a call from our logistics guy and uh, he had a very deep southern voice and he calls, Ed, you need to come on down there. there there's some down here from Sweden for you. And I'm like, what are you talking about, Bill? Well, we're not opening it because we don't know what it is. I'm like, okay, Bill, okay. So I went down there, and sure enough, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful document. Um, I could get all nerdy on you and show you some of the integrals that he used to determine uh, the distributions and some of the statistics that he used. Um, there are some of the uh, photographic plates that he used in determining it, so it's, it's a one of my prized possessions book-wise. Book so, 
we'll continue on. There's good old Per Colander's dissertation. Um, so next, we're going to go to an open cluster that's visible in the summer and autumn night sky. It's called Colander. Yeah, yeah, yeah let's do give Colander, you know, thumbs up again. Colander 399. It is also known as the coat hanger because if you look at it, it looks like a coat hanger. It's also known as Brochi's cluster. So, scientists around the end of the 1990s uh, were able to have some uh, space probes go up where they were able to actually measure more accurately the distances of stars. And as you notice, in the coat hanger, in 399, you have a wide variety of stars. They're not really, you know, you got a few red, probably red giants, you got a few what are called main sequence, you know, yellow stars and maybe a blue star. So they did a measurement, they did measurements of the main stars that make up the coat hanger. It is not an open cluster. Because the stars that you actually see there, actually, strangely enough, I still have the printout from three years ago when I made a presentation, but the distances vary from about th uh, 235 light years to over 2,300 light years. So that cannot be an open cluster because there's such a vast difference distance-wise between the stars that it is pretty much an, what's called an optical open cluster. It purely looks like an open cluster because when you look at it, hey, that's cool, that's great, it's an open cluster. It's not. It's literally an asterism that looks like a coat hanger upside down. Okay? They, um, it was a probe called hypo. Karchus, and they're able to utilize interferometry, what's called interferometry, where you're able to do what's called parallax, where they're able to measure in a very, very small amount. When the star's there, it's this angle. When it moves, it's that angle. And they're able to really, I mean, the, the distances are plus and minus a pretty big number. But they were able to utilize inter what's called interferometry in order to make that make that determination. Right. Yeah. And it and uh, parallax is the is the big big word that the operative term there. So it's the whole well. If it if it was close to us, it would make a real big you know swing. Farther away, it's going to make a smaller smaller. Because you're me you measure off of something you know, and you go, okay, this is only moving this far. How far did that go? Well, that went not as far. So you throw in some geometry, and you throw in some fancy schmancy math, and you end up being able to measure the distances. Yes? Can I ask a rather silly question? No question silly. <coughs> when you have something in your scope, yes. you're watching it move like this, right? very slowly. Right. It's the rotation of the Earth, now, yes. Does that, come into con does that come into play at all when they're measuring distance? No. Because, because the distances they're measuring are when the Earth is here and it's, a, it's over many, many days, it's over months, months and months where that star has moved. Not, not with the Earth's rotation in one night. It's, it's there in October. Where is it in April? or June, or May, or whatever time frame, and where, what is the angle all that's off at that point in time? Not in, in one night's uh, just oh. dusk to dawn.
Um, so as I was mentioning earlier, uh, one of the things I really enjoy about astronomy or amateur astronomy is the aesthetic, um, aesthetically pleasing uh, beauty of it. And in the constellation Cassiopeia is a con uh, an open cluster. It's actually considered an open cluster. It's called NGC 7789. It's also known as Caroline's Cluster because William Herschel's sister, Caroline, was the first one to identify it. Um, when I had smaller telescopes, was the first time I found it. It was like, wow, look at that. That looks pretty cool. Because, <coughs> see me, with a smaller telescope, even with a higher magnification, it's still a rather symmetrical fuzzball. But as I increased the aperture, the size of my telescopes, so was I able to identify more of the stars or see more of the stars. So with a larger telescope, even with a, a lower power magnification, it's a beautiful explosion of stars. It's like you just sprinkled a bunch of diamonds on a black piece of velvet. It's really beautiful. Also, Cassiopeia is in what part of the night sky? Near where the Milky Way is in the fall and summer. So you have lots and lots of stars also around it. And um, Here's a little bit more of a zoom in, but it's right here and it's a really beautiful object. And it is about 7,600 light years away. And it's also known as the White Rose Cluster. It's a really beautiful object. All right, so now we're gonna talk about what the, the next grouping of clusters. They're called globular clusters. And they are a spherical collection of stars. That's why they're called globular, because they look like a globe. They're very tightly bound by the gravitational forces within that cluster. And they're found usually in the ha what's called the halo of galaxies, which is usually into in the center area of, of a galaxy. Um, there are 52 globular clusters in the Milky Way. And I'm saying that because we're going to also look at a globular cluster that is not part of our galaxy. You're able to actually see globular clusters in other galaxies, and we'll look at that in a minute. Um, there is what's called the Shapley-Sawyer concentration class. Let's get a little nerdy here. Uh, it's based on concentration, and it has numer uh, Roman numerals 1 through 12. So let's um, do a little bit of a survey here. What's considered class 1 is Messier Object 75. And there are quite a few Messier objects that are globular clusters. Why? Because they're fuzzy objects and he kept seeing the fuzzy objects time and time again. <coughs> so, M75 is about 76 or 70, uh, I'm sorry, 67,000 light years away from us. Whereas the open clusters were closer the globular clusters are farther away from us. They're also a lot older uh, objects. I'll be talking about a few in a minute about that are much, much older. Uh, M3 is in what's called the constellation Canis Venatici, which is actually visible tonight. Yeah. No, nope, it's a, yeah, because you got Virgo up and it's north of Virgo and up, up that way. Um, M3 uh, is about 40,000 light years away from us. And would like anyone like to ponder a guess as to the estimate of the number of stars that are in M3? Come on. Uh, like we had 100,000? More. Million. Almost, about half a million, half a million stars make up M3. So if you were, a, you were on a planet in the middle of that cluster, your night sky would be an absolute amazing thing to, to, to see. Um, but there are estimates that there are 500,000 stars that make up that cluster. Do we know how close they are? Yes, actually, um, there are estimates. I did not put that down though. But they, do, are, they are able to estimate uh, some of the distances. 
Um, No, because the gravitational forces that keep them bound kind of keep them away. Because as one comes closer to another star, the gravitational forces of another star pulls it away. So it's this literal locked-in dance that the, that the stars are in, because they're all kind of holding each other in in in, uh, in limbo. Uh, M55 over here is in Sagittarius in the summertime. It's a beautiful globular cluster. <coughs> Excuse me. It's about 17,500 light years away from Earth. And they were able to actually measure the distance across. And the estimates are that it's about 48 to 50 light years across. That's how big it is. Um, so let's go to the next one. What defines the different classes of the the concentrate uh, the concentration. How many M per volume? Right. How how dense is it? How you know is it a really th is it I'll call it thin versus really highly densely concentrated with the stars. Um, a few more prime examples. Prime, prime examples. M13. Hopefully you'll be able to see M13. M13 is the Great Hercules Cluster globular. Uh, M13 is about 22,000 light years away from us. Um, its radius is about 84,000 light years, so it's about 160 light years across. Its age, it's estimated that it's about 11 to 12 billion years old. So those are some old stars. Globulars are very old stars compared to open clusters. Uh, we also, next we have M15, which is in Pegasus. Which is another one of those great ones that has about 300,000 stars in it. It's a beautiful, also a wonderful object. M5 in Serpens which is uh, a summer object. This is another great one. Ben, I don't know if you've spoken to this already, so excuse me if I'm being redundant. But I've heard it suggested that some of the bigger globulars are mini galaxies that were captured by the Milky Way's gravity. Is, is there any truth in that? There are those theories, and some of them lie in the fact that the globulars reside in that halo area of the of the of the uh, Milky Way or within galaxies. So it's that it's almost like they've they're theorizing that the stars that were on the outer outer periphery of those miniature galaxies were stripped away, and all you're left with is this sort of core that makes up the globular. Of the Milky Way, but not, not of the Milky Way, but whatever, what, whatever they ca it captured, had, had captured. Um, M, like we were talking about, M55. It's another really nice picture of M55 in Sagittarius. You can see it's extremely, <coughs> excuse me, concentrated. Now, uh, we were talking about extragalactic globulars. This globular cluster here called Andromeda G1. Can anyone guess what constellation Andromeda G1 is in? It's in the Andromeda Galaxy. And the Andromeda Galaxy is about 2.5 million light years away. It's actually uh, visible to the naked eye. Um, it's quite wonderful when you look at it in a, a nice rich field telescope, a smaller, not, not especially a smaller one, but one that has a nice wide view, because it's actually a rather large object. Um, but it is phenomenal because with larger telescopes, larger amateur telescopes, you're actually able to view some of the globular clusters that make up, uh, that are reside in Andromeda. And I'll talk a little bit about those at the end because I have some other resources that are usable 
for observing. Oh, so now we get to how to observe. Lists and resources. So, like I mentioned, you've got Paul, uh, Colander's uh, dissertation. The list of star, uh, open clusters is readily, readily available on the internet. Um, there's a lot of them. Some of them, quite a few of them overlap with Messier objects. Like M45 is actually considered a colander object. Um, you also have what's called the Astronomical League Open Cluster Club and Globular Cluster Club. Uh, the Open Cluster Club listing is available on the internet. You can download that. Um, a vast majority of those objects are very easily observed in a location like here. Um, there are a few of what they call challenge objects <coughs> that might need a little bit more of a darker sky, but a vast majority of those are viewable with a nice pair of binoculars. So if you're starting out with like a, a pair of 8 by 56s or something like that, perfect for looking at open clusters. You got the Messier list. Uh, you have what's called the NGC list. Um, there's a great book called Star Clusters, and it's by Brent Archinal and Stephen Hines. Um, an interesting thing about Brent is that Brent is one of the original, original members of Novak. Uh, when Novak became a club back in, I believe it was 1991, Brent was one of the uh, original members. Uh, he's a scientist with the USGS, and he's out in Flagstaff now. So he's a long-distance member of NOVAC, but he uh, worked on this book with Stephen Hines, and it's an awesome, fantastic book. Um, even if you're not overly scientific, it's still a wonderful reference for observing or learning about uh, clusters. Now, I have a copy of... Um, the Globular Cluster Observing Club uh, manual. And when I mention that <coughs> you have your list of, of clusters, some of the clusters you have to observe in order to get, there's like two different levels of observing. Uh, for the higher, uh, the more involved um, involved list, you have to actually observe some extra, extra galactic clusters, and, and they're listed in here. Um, you have to take a look at least two of the uh, globulars that are in Andromeda, and then there's a whole boatload of others for you to observe. It's a great, great, great resor resource also. So how to observe continued equipment? <coughs> Excuse me, as I mentioned, binoculars are a great, they're awesome for open clusters. They are good for globulars because they're not drawing in as much light as you really need to really enjoy globular clusters. Like a 10 inch telescope, you start seeing some really great stuff. You get into 12 inch and it's awesome. You get into one of these gigantic monsters that are out here that are 24, 25 inches, and it's like a, a complete, absolute explosion of stars that you're looking at. So binoculars is a great way also to learn about the night sky. It's a, a great introduction to the, to the hobby. Uh, Richfield Telescope, something that's like a, they still make them now, is a Teleview Pronto, or not Teleview Pronto, but like a Teleview 85, or one of the 100 millimeter um, shorter focal length telescopes that has a ni nice wide uh, view is really great for open clusters. It's good for globulars, you're getting there. Uh, but larger scopes, like some of the monsters that you see out here, you get into like the 18, 20, 25 inch scopes, globulars explode. It's too largest telescope for open clusters because you'll be looking at the open, you'll be looking like for example at, the, at uh, the Pleiades and the Pleiades are like about this big and with one of the bigger scopes 
you're only going to be looking at a section of it that's like this. So you really aren't able to enjoy open clusters as much as globulars. But you get one of those out and you look at like M3 or M13 in Hercules and it's an uh, absolutely phenomenal uh, view. So that's what I got for you folks. Any, oh, thank you. Questions. Ah, that's a good question. Actually, there are some they they think do have. There is one I don't remember which one because when I was looking in, looking them up, they actually think that there is one that does have a black hole in the middle of it. What was the magnification of uh, most of those uh, clusters that you were showing? The globulars are in the like seven to eight, six, seven, eight. I mean, like M13 is a relatively bright object. It's about four and a half to five magnitude. Magnification. Oh, magnification. Magnification is not really the key. Um, it, it's all going to depend on what telescope you have as to what... Oh, you have a 10 inch? For globulars, you'd want to be looking at it with a, probably a... Oh my goodness! You probably want to know, not go over a hundred, max out at about a hundred, but like between fifty and a hundred be, would be awesome. But the more you crank up the magnification in a ten inch, the more you're the more detail you're going to see. Um, that is right at the cusp of when you're starting to see some awesome, awesome views with with globulars. Some of them are more challenging because they're more compact, farther away, and you need a bigger scope with more magnification to really enjoy them. But a 10 inch, you can pretty much enjoy all the Messiers, no problem. Um, download, you can't unfortunately download the globular list off the AEL, uh, Astronomical League. You have to buy the book, unfortunately. Open Cluster Club, you can download it. Um, Excuse me, but with the globulars, they mainly have a lot of uh, extra notes on the the various globulars. But since there's only 152 of them or 150 of them, the list of what they are and where they are is is also readily available. Okay. Are there binoculars specifically made for star watching or? Ah, that's a good. There are recommended. There are some that are specifically, yes, made for astronomical observing. Um, you'll find some that are 70 millimeter, which are pretty darn big. I have a, a set of those. Those are really big and heavy. And those are, those are specifically made for astronomical observing. But as I mentioned, if you go to, uh, I want to say Orion Telescope, or Celestron or any of those and they have what are called like 9 by 56s are a great introductory pair of binoculars because the bigger you get the heavier the binocular the more you need to have something to hold the binocular like I have a set of what are called 10 by 70 Fujinons and those are very specifically made for astronomical observing but you got to put them on a, on a tripod because they are, you can use them as a as a self-defense weapon. One of the perks of being in Novak, as, as they would know, is that we have a loaner scope program uh, with two three members, and it's great particularly for people who haven't bought their telescope or binoculars because you can take them out. There's a few sometimes, sometimes they're ready to go. And you can try out, we have binoculars and we have uh, telescopes and things like that. They won't join with this magnificent sum of something like 35 bucks a month a year. Uh, you can take out and pair of things and see them. If you like that particular type of scope or binoculars before you throw them on there. That's great. Yeah. 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 So you mentioned yeah. some of them are just very like years yeah. away, this yeah. many million. But yeah. the stars that are within them, ha like, how, m how much how much distance is there as far as distance from the Earth between them? 
like the furthest to the closest. You know what I mean? Within, from from us to them, or within the actual cluster itself? No, no. Like okay, like you said, the clusters that's the seventy million light years away. Right. But some of those stars are further from us. Okay. Well, or with are the they kind of in the same plane. Oh, there you are. Oh, for them to be an open cluster, they're going to be in the same plane. They're going to be at the same distance. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's why the coat hanger is not really an open cluster because the stars are at, at different different, di different distances. Okay. Um, for it to be an actual open cluster, they have to be in the same proximity, yeah, yeah. being held in that same location. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yeah, thank well, thank you. you.